Oh, thank you very much. Uh, Dave said yesterday that some of these pairings were of, seemed to be of people who were sympathetic to each other, and uh, that's certainly the case here. Uh, Andy is not only someone uh, with whom I have a lot in, uh, in sympathy, but he's, he's something of a hero, I think I would say. And it occurred to me yesterday as we were trudging over the, um, over the tundra that uh, a little metaphor occurred to me that Andy's, as we're as we all trudging along there on this, this trek, Andy is the person who sort of run up ahead and climbed uh, the hill ahead of us and uh, seen what lies in front and he's turning around to the rest of us and saying, come on, hurry up, come and look at the view. And, uh, and he's, he's doing that right now still. Um, with a new book later this year, which uh, it's called Surfing Uncertainty, isn't it? I got the idea it was called Surfing the Future, but I think that's what Andy's doing all the time, is surfing the future. So, um, let's see. Andy has given us two papers to talk about. Uh, the first, uh, the, the access uh, and Qualia paper is, is a short paper, an elegant proposal, I think, for bridging the supposedly unbridgeable gap between the structural and the phenomenal. And the second paper, of course, is this, this recent BBS paper, which is a very ambitious and incredibly detailed and impressive and awe-inspiring uh, model of neural architecture which promises to unify perception, action, and cognition. It's, it's an amazing paper. I need to read it another 10 times before I will be in a position to fully appreciate what's going off there and to say anything intelligent about it, I think. Um, so I'm going to focus on the first paper, but I think the, the sort of interesting question for us, if we could, if we could make any, any, any headway on it, is whether these two perspectives can be unified, whether some of the, the, uh, whether the elegant proposal for linking the subpersonal and the personal, the structural and the phenomenal, uh, in, the, in the first paper can, can be, uh, whether that strategy can be uh, unified with the, the architecture, the neural architecture in the second, that would be rather wonderful yeah, if it could be done. Um, so I'm just first of all going to go quickly through the argument in the first paper. Uh, uh, can everyone hear me? Uh, okay, that's great. Thanks. Do we, if I, if I, sometimes I, I tend to I might tend to mumble, so please let me know if I, if I, if I do. So the argument, I think, um, it's, it's an impressively uh, <coughs> short uh, argument. Um, so suppose a subject uh, detects a color difference between two visually presented objects, a red object and a yellow object. Well, we can imagine two cases. In the first, the subject has no direct introspective access to the means by which they detect the difference. They have no introspective access to the sensory activity itself. So they can't tell that it's visual. They can't directly tell that it's visual. I mean, they might infer because it's, it's, a, it's a color difference that they're detecting that it has something to do with their eyes, but they're not directly aware of it as visual. Uh, so they're disposed to say, well, there's, I, I think there's a red object and there's a yellow object, uh, but they deny that they see anything. It's, they're, they're blindsided. And the second case, it's just, they, they do have this. They do have direct introspective access to the means by which they detect the difference. They can tell that it's visual. They can tell directly, non-inferentially, not by working out that it's a color difference and therefore it must involve their eyes or by covering their eyes and seeing that they can't, they can no longer make the detection. They, they have direct access to the, um, to the, to the, to the modality, to the sensory modality. So they were aware in this case of, not just of the objects, they were aware of seeing the objects. Uh, please, if I, if I, if I go, go wrong um, or oversimplify, do, do, do correct me. So in the second case, the thought is the, the subject will report qualia. Uh, if, you, if one has direct introspective access to the modality by which a difference uh, a detection is made, then there will seem to be some modality-specific difference 
between the objects discriminated. That's just what it is to be aware of the detection as a visual one. So there will, it will be, will certainly seem to be like something to detect the difference. That's precisely what's being added. Hence, the story about access entails uh, the facts about qualia. Was that reasonably? Except for just being careful not to beg the question by thinking that we know we're seeing in that qualitative sense, because that would just beg the question. So it must be that we know. They're aware that it's a, that it, that it's a visual modality. Exactly. Yeah. They're aware. Of it, well, uh, so they're aware that it's that it's visual rather than oral, tactile. Okay. Yeah. They're not aware of seeing in any form. Not aware. Yeah. You can't, it can't be saying experience in the act of seeing because obviously that's what we're trying to explain. And they're experiencing the visual detection. Is that right? The visuality of their detection. The visuality of the detection. Right, OK, yeah. yeah. But they will say that they're seeing. Yes, they have. To. They will say that they're seeing. So, but that's the conclusion, not the, not the, not yeah. the premise. Yeah, OK, yeah, OK, right, good. Um, so just some comments on that. What we mean by direct introspective access there is that it's non-inferential access, non-inferential at the personal level. There may be some sort of subpersonal processes involved in mediating this, but there's no personal inference. The subject doesn't have to do anything to, to work out that they're seeing. Um, and what we have access to, hopefully this will be, what we have access to are characteristic properties of the sensory activity, or the, the encoding, the sensory encoding. Uh, we have access to properties that make the detection distinctively visual rather than, say, oral. Something about the detection process is distinctively visual rather than oral or tactile or whatever. And it's not just that the information comes to us as tagged as visual. It's not just that we think, oh, I can, I can, uh, there are two objects here, one red and one yellow, and it seems to be visual. You know, it's not just that we're sort of blindsided about the modality, we actually have some kind of direct access to features that are distinctive of that modality. Um, and what are these properties to which we have access? Well, Andy makes two suggestions. One is that they might be the properties of the representational vehicles involved. There may be distinctive vehicles associated with visual perception, oral perception, and so on. And we have access to the formal properties of these vehicles. So we can, we can tell the difference between the, uh, the detection by detecting the distinctive vehicles. That supposes that each sensory modality uses different, formally different kinds of representations, structurally different. Um, the other option, that would seem to me, I think that's actually quite close to a sort of higher order perception theory, wouldn't it be? Yeah, maybe my least preferred option of the two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But it, 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 it is pretty close to, to high order. But the preferred option is that it's, it's, it's access to, um, the idea is that each sensory modality is associated with a different set of skill, skill sets is the, the word you use, but affordances, different opportunities for action are made available by different sensory modalities. So I suppose vision is, is particularly connected with spatial orientation. And, Smell is, is associated with, uh, with different kinds of responses. Um, and so the idea is there are different sets of affordances associated with each central modality in a given situation. And yes, they, the information they provide is available to, to guide behavior in different ways. And we're aware of these, these affordances, the, these sort of skill sets that are made salient by the information that's, um, uh, that's being. Uh, Detected, and also finding that Andy suggests in the paper, and that here's this uh, offers a possible link with Jess's perspective that uh, this uh, kind of access may require attention, on which view attention would be would be necessary, would be required for phenomenal uh, consciousness. Okay, so a couple of comments there about what this, what sort of conception of qualia we have here. Um, this, this looks at first sight as if 
what we're explaining, uh, the, the natural objection someone might make is, well, this would explain why the person is disposed to judge that they, um, they have qualia. They would say, well, because they are detecting this, this sensory specific difference, they are saying there's, there's something distinctively visual that's different about these two things. But that's just explaining the judgment that they make. It's not explaining the qualia themselves. And, and it's kind of, I think, a little bit sort of ambivalent. He doesn't want to, 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 to fully embrace that conclusion. So he, 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 he insists that another condition must be met. For one to have genuinely visual qualia, this, we must be disposed to make this judgment. And this disposition must be grounded in veridical introspective access to distinctive features of the sensory encoding must be grounded in the right way. So one could be wrong, we could, make, we could be disposed to say that one is having visual qualia, but one could be wrong. Uh, and finally, this story doesn't, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, has limited ambitions. It doesn't uh, seek to explain specific quality difference, why, differences, why red looks red. Uh, it just explains why it looks like something, why there is some qualitative difference between uh, uh, red and yellow. Okay, so some. How am I doing? Uh, some quick thoughts on that. First, this is what I would call an illusionist theory. Uh, on this view, I think experiences don't have qualia in any really substantive sense. What they have are introspectable properties that dispose us to judge that they have qualia. Um, so that's what I would call minimal qualia, if, if or zero qualia. Um, and also, this—it seems to be crucial to this story that our, I think I think I think this is right—that our introspective access to the sensory encoding is is partial, is is restricted, is limited. That seems to be actually a crucial feature. We have just enough access to mark the modality as being distinctively visual rather than oral or tactile or whatever. Uh, I, I, and that's why we, 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 ha, we, we, we incline to say there's this ineffable something there about it. If we had more detailed access, then we might not feel that there was something kind of mysterious and strange and ineffable, ineffable about it. So if I'm not uh, over-interpreting, I think the idea is that our sense that uh, well, let's put that, that uh, well, phenomenal consciousness is an artifact of the limitations of introspection. That's what I'm saying. So it's, it's not because there's something extra, it's because there's not enough, in a way. <laughs> there we have. Um, I won't go yet. Yeah, that's what's still there. Could this account be extended to explain the character of specific experience? Could it explain why red looks red rather than just why it looks like something? Uh, well, Andy doesn't suggest that it could, so I suspect it's not easy to see how. Is it, is it easy? <laughs> you can do it. Oh, well, yeah, please do. I mean, the, I, I assume a strategy would have to go something. It's lucky because it'd be really disappointing if you could. <laughs> yeah. um, the, I don't know. The, I, I mean, it seemed that the way to extend it would be to find some sort of structure within visual qualia, then to find some sort of, that might be relational, relations to other sense modalities, uh, you know, that red is approaching or whatever, uh, and then find some sort of mapping between features of the sensory encoding of red detection uh, and the features of red qualia, uh, such that a subject who introspected the, the sensory encoding would be inclined to, at the, at the right level of detail, the right sort of restricted level of detail, would tend to say that they had red qualia. I suppose that's, that's a sort of literal-minded kind of extension of it. But, um, OK, so, I mean, uh, Andy will tell me about that. I'll just run through now three points that sort of worries, and that I'll then sort of suggest a response. Um, Here's one that I think perhaps a first-order representationalist might make. Um, 
They might say, well, look, we, we, we've acknowledged that we could have a sort of blindsided access to the sensor encoded. A subject could be inclined to say, well, I think there's a red object and a yellow object, and I think I'm detecting them visually, but uh, I'm not seeing anything. Well, that's the tagging store, isn't it? They could, it's just, just the tagging store. They say, OK, I think there's a red object, I think there's a yellow object. And, uh, and we say to them, well, how do you think you're taking this? Oh, I think it's visual, but I don't see anything. So here it seems that awareness of the sensor encoding in itself, access to the sens sensor encoding in itself, just information about the sensor encoding isn't enough. It has to be the right sort of access. It has to be the right sort of access to the sensor encoding. It has to be this direct introspective awareness. And now someone might worry here about whether you can tell that story without building in some sort of notion of the qualitative to distinguish between the tagging and the actual genuine introspective awareness. Uh, and I guess a first order representationalist might say, well, what that shows is that what matters is not having awareness of something else as well as the, 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 the thing detected. It's having the right sort of access to the thing detected, namely non-blindsighted access to it. Uh, so you don't need to sort of introduce this second component because you're going to have to make the same distinction for that second component. You're going to have to make the distinction between blindsided access and the sort of access that actually counts. Uh, now I think that actually, I think that misunderstands Andy's proposal um, since I don't think the claim, that Andy's not claiming that introspective awareness of the sensory coding gives us conscious awareness of the sensory encoding. It gives us conscious awareness of the object. So in order to have, in order for our awareness of the sensory encoding to be conscious, we'd need to have introspective access to the modality employed in introspection. It's the sort of thing that a higher, uh, that a higher order theorist might say, I guess. Um, so I, I think Andy's OK on that. But I still want to know more about this nature of this introspective axis that distinguishes it from, from mere tagging. And um, that can be told without uh, begging questions. Um, another issue, which I, I already mentioned, is um, Andy claims there's more to having qualia than being disposed to make, uh, to make judgments about them. The judgments have to be veridical. They have to be grounded in veridical access to uh, properties of the sensory encoding. And that just that sort of opens the way to skepticism about qualia. I mean, if my introspective mechanisms are playing up, then it might, I might be inclined to judge that I'm having red qualia uh, when, when, I, when I'm not, when, I, when, when, uh, when I'm not veridically detecting um, the sensory encoding appropriate to detecting uh, the, to visual detection. Uh, and I mean, there seem to be real life cases like that where we, we think that we're tasting something when we actually know it's, it, it's smell. Uh, or the McGurk effect, where, um, where visual perception influences auditory uh, perception. And in these cases, it would seem to be, if we the, if I seem to hear someone saying B because uh, of uh, um, my um, uh, the visual inputs, then it seems I'm not actually hearing B, um, which seems confu which seems, well, it seems counterintuitive. Um, I, what I would do there is I would simply just distinguish two, two notions of qualia, narrow qualia and, and wide qualia, where wide qualia are just our dispositions to make qualia judgments, and narrow qualia are dispositions to make qualia judgments that are grounded in veridical awareness of the sensory, the relevant sensory encodings. And then subjectively, when, you know, when we're talking about how, uh, what it's like, it's wide qualia that we're interested in. But maybe narrow qualia are much more interesting from the point of view of uh, cognitive psychology. Maybe that's the natural kind. Um, maybe. OK, so finally, uh, to come on to the, the connection to the, to, the, um, to the later paper. This doesn't seem 
the hierarchical predictive processing model. Um, this, at first sight, doesn't seem to naturally link up with, with the earlier paper. Uh, the point here is that at the higher level, what we, what, what we have is a unified non-modality specific model of the, the, the external world. And this model generates predictions that then cascade down and can shape the activity in modality specific systems. So it's, it's, it's undermining uh, the, the modal modality specific nature of perception. So how then can we apply this access story, access to the distinct, to what's distinctive of particular uh, sorts of detection, modality specific sorts of detection, when this distinction is undermined by the model? And um, I mean, that's, that's a, it's a problem about applying the earlier story, but of course it's a problem in itself because the experience does have a modality specific character. So we've got to solve the, the second problem and it, presumably if we can solve the second problem then we can straight away apply the, the solution. Um, uh, but certainly there is, there is something here that needs to be done. Uh, what I would suggest one model of that is of the two versions of uh, the access story, whether it's access to vehicles or access to affordances, uh, then it's obviously, I think, got to be affordances, since there just aren't distinctive vehicles on this version. Uh, but that was never Andy's favorite view anyway, so that's, that's, that's good. Um, but then it seems I still have this sort of problem that what we're going to have is a kind of global set of affordances that uh, in each in each situation, we're just going to be what, what we're going to be aware of is a, uh, is, is, a, is a complex set of affordances corresponding to all the actions made available by a best current model. So we're going to have a sort of global qualitative feel to our experience that is not par parceled out into distinctive sensory modalities. It's just got this global set of things that I could do here. Um, so it, this could sort of explain why we feel there's a, some sort of gen generic qualitative character to the scene, but how do we, how do we extract, how do we highlight from that particular modality specific qualitative aspects? And well, this is, Andy needs to take over really, but I suppose I'm, that, that's a suggestion that it's attention. Because attention plays an important role in the story, one that uh, it's, it's uh, I mean, it, it's discussed in the paper, but I think there's, there's room to say a lot more about the role of it. And so the idea there is that, I mean, I can just read that, that uh, it's a means of variably balancing uh, the interactions between top-down and bottom-up influences by, by tuning the error units, the, the, the units that send feedback on the, on the model. And this sort of highlights, I mean, actually, I'd be better to let Andy explain this himself. Because, but the idea is that it tunes up particular, um, uh, particular parts of the signal. Is that, would that be right? With it, with it tunes, that attention tunes into particular parts of the signal, the, the signals that are driving this process. It ups the weighting on particular Absolutely. prediction error units. On particular yeah. prediction error signals that are. Right. So that, and that could, that could highlight specific modality specific aspects of the. It'll just highlight whatever's salient. Whatever's salient. And so is there a potential there to, well, I'll, I'll let you come and, and tell us whether there's, whether there's that. But that's, that seems to be one resource that's available to you to do that. And how you do it is a question for somebody smarter than me. So I'll leave it there.